Unity of Houston is an inclusive church where we seek to understand and live the teachings of Jesus and other spiritual masters. At Unity, we welcome all people from all spiritual paths and every walk of life. We celebrate the diversity of our city and of our world, and we teach love, tolerance, and oneness, seeking to live in harmony with open minds and open hearts. Wherever you are in your spiritual path, you are always welcome at Unity. Join us and discover that the life of your dreams is already within you. It's so good to be back. I feel like I've been gone so long. <laughs> I uh, was off the last two Wednesdays because I was in this little show called Sweeney Times. <laughs> it reopened and I'm so happy. Um, and I'm filled with creative energy. So I'm happy that we are on this topic, this wonderful book that... Well, Karen and I chose it, but really, I, I said, Karen, Karen, you know, I'm sad. She's a short timer. She's just, this is our last series together, and, uh, and, I, and I want her to pick this, and, and this sparked her and, and inspired her, so I'm really blessed that we get to do this together again, um, you know, again, meaning another series together. <laughs> so, um, yes, Elizabeth Gilbert's book, Big Magic, Creative Living Beyond Fear. So this is exciting. And I want to remind you of the very first words that we have in our sacred scripture, the Bible, Genesis 1. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? So we want to remember that one part, God created. God created. So this all began with creativity. Creativity is at the, the very essence of our being. The yeah, very essence of life is creativity. Uh, life is truly a creation. Moment by moment we're creating. And we're each endowed with divine faculties, creative faculties. We get to create our lives. We get to create our lives. And if you feel like you have not been in control of creating your life, if it feels like you're just kind of trudging along, this is your reminder reminder that you do get to create your life. So what are you creating? What is it that you're creating? You would consider that. In our meditation tonight, I invited you to tap into some memories, some touch points in your life of what sparked your creativity, what lit you up. For me, as a child, it was performing. I started dancing when I was four. I was in a recital and, and I just get on stage. There's something in me just lit up. I just loved it. And, um, and, I, and as I look through, as I see like the thread, I talked about the thread, that that thread brought me to, to ministry and, and how cool that I get to do this and, and, I, and I get to be in front of you all and share these wonderful teachings that are meaningful to me um, and beyond the entertainment value of getting to be on stage. That, that was a development for me that, that meant so much. So consider what dream you hold in your heart. Is there something that's longing to be expressed? Do you want to write a book? Do you want to create art? It's not just about being in the arts, this series, this topic. It's really for everyone. You could find new ways to address challenges at work and relationships and maybe to travel, maybe to simply live with more presence and mindfulness and passion. What is calling to your heart and what brings you life? So there are clues in the meditation that are there for how you can live more creative, creatively now. Elizabeth Gilbert wrote this book she shared because she wanted to give you insights into her own generative process. We know she wrote Eat, Pray, Love, right? Yeah. Seen the movie, many of us imagine what a, what a great book. I love that book. It's so um, different and inspiring and, and personal. And so she's written many books since then. And she shares with us what holds you back in the creative process and then how you can work through that so that you really can thrive. So I'm excited to share that with you. With the pandemic that we've been through, we're living in a time where people are more feeling more depressed and anxious and isolated and out of touch with community than really ever before, it seems like. It seems like uh, we have 
created this wonderful culture of live streaming where we're letting you know you can sit at home and just watch the service. And it's great. We love the connection with our live streamers. And also, think about it, if we're live streaming everything in life, whatever that means to you, becoming an onlooker, you don't have to sing if you're at home. You don't really have to say the prayers. You don't even have to really do the meditation. Maybe get up, get something to drink, come back. You know? <laughs> um, where we're not fully engaging with the experience. And so I'm not trying to pick on you guys on live stream. We love you. But I'm just saying, think about that in other ways, too, where that we've been disengaging, really, from life and becoming onlookers and therefore not having that visceral experience of, of being somewhere and doing something. To free ourselves from the limitations that we've put on our lives, we have to take a risk to do something different. There's a risk involved, she shares with us. And she uses as an example this wonderful American poet, Jack Gilbert. Same last name, but they're not related. And what was really interesting about the connection and how she found out about this poet is that she took a creative writing teaching position at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville and he had held that position before her. So she inherited his office and, and got to read his poems, got to learn more about him. And this is what he, one of the things he told his students. He said, we must, we must risk delight. Risk delight. Love that. We must have the stubbornness to accept our gladness in the ruthless furnace of this world. <laughs> Great image. Picture a poet would write that, right? The stubbornness to accept our gladness. That insistence. I will live a life of joy and goodness and creativity and love. Oh, yes, I will, no matter what is going on in the world and in my life. Most of all, he asked his students to be brave, which, thank you, Tamika, <laughs> perfect timing on that one. He said, without bravery, you will never realize the scope of your capabilities. And without bravery, you will never really know the world as it wants to be known. Without bravery, he told his students, your lives are going to stay small and far smaller than you really want your lives to be. Living small is when we know we have hidden treasures, you know, you know you've got some good in there, something that wants to be seen, right? But it can be so painful to not express that. See, when I think about that, when I've limited myself from my creativity, it feels like a hand on my chest. Like, oh, I can't. I, I can't. It's like, a, oh, I feel stifled, and that's, that's that weighted down feeling, and we can get bogged down into it. Have you had that, relate to that feeling, where you feel like, like um, it's just painful to know that there's something you can do or want to do, and you're not doing it. We can give our lives away to please others, or we can risk a life that brings us true joy. One day after his poetry class, this author, Jack Gilbert, he pulled aside one of his students and he complimented her on her poetry and asked her what she wanted to do with her life. And she said to him, she kind of hesitated because he was kind of a big deal. And she said, well, I want to be a writer. And with great compassion, he asked her, do you have the courage? Do you have the courage to bring forth this work? The treasures that are hidden inside you are hoping you will say yes. We're hoping you're the treasures want you to say yes. Are you guys willing to say yes? Yes? Okay, okay. Elizabeth Gilbert says, we are all walking repositories of buried treasures. <laughs> Sounds piratey, but exciting. <laughs> she said, this is one of the oldest and most generous tricks the universe plays on us human beings, both for its own amusement and for ours. The universe buries strange jewels deep within us all and then stands back and sees if we can find them. And the re surprising results of this hunt are what she calls big magic. That's what the big magic is about. I know it's almost Halloween, so 
<laughs> it's not that kind of magic. It's that r the real stuff, the good stuff in us, what lights us up. So creative living is a life that is driven by curiosity, she said. Curiosity rather than fear. And she gives this example of a good friend of hers, Susan, who reached her 40th birthday and she was looking over her life as we can tend to do when we hit a milestone birthday like that. And she was considering what it is that lit her up. And she realized she didn't have anything in her life that did that. She was 40 years old. And when she looked back, she remembered that she loved to skate. And she used to skate competitively, but she gave up when she was 15 because she wasn't Olympic material. Even though she did well in her competitions, she wasn't going to be a star skater. So she gave up. She, since she couldn't be the best, why bother? And so she didn't skate for 25 years. But she was restless at 40. She was restless. And so she realized that since she hadn't felt that way since she was a teenager, that she wanted to just kind of check it out. So she found her way to a rink. She hired a coach. She got there early in the morning, got a pair, bought, bought a pair of skates for herself, and started skating. And was it easy? Well, there were lots of nine-year-olds there <laughs> who were lovely skaters, but she didn't, was not going to let herself feel ridiculous or self-conscious because she was the only middle-aged lady there. She just did it. And three mornings a week, she started going before work, before the sun came out, and she was out there with the, with the kids skating. Before her demanding day job, she skated and she skated and she just loved it more and more the more she did it because even as an adult, what, what she noticed as an adult that was different from how she loved it as a child was that she finally had the perspective to really appreciate the value of her own joy. How she had, she had let this go from her life for 25 years and it made her feel alive and ageless to do this. Now, what's important to note here that Elizabeth tells us is she didn't quit her job, she didn't get a, she didn't move to Toronto and try to do the Olympics or do competitions, anything like that. It wasn't that. It was just the skating itself gave her the transcendent experience and a sense of beauty that was so deep that she couldn't access in any other way in her life. But it spilled over into everything because she was lit up. She was alive to do this. And she didn't have to be the best in the world to do it. And she just wanted to spend as much time in that transcendent state that she felt when she was skating as much time as possible while she was on this planet. And she's, Elizabeth tells us that's the creative way there. And it'll vary from person to person what that is for you that takes you into that transcendent state. And the thing about it is that it will lead you to a bigger life, a more expanded life, a happier life, but it's also more scary. It's more scary to live out big like that. So you have to have courage to bring forth the treasures that are in you. But if you and if you already do, she says, if you're already doing that thing that lights you up, you don't need any courage, you feel like you're good, she said, you don't really need this book. This is a book, so good on you. This is, <laughs> this is a book for people who need, need some um, encouragement to go further, right? The, she says, the creative path is for the brave. So let's look at some of the reasons why you might have fear. I relate to these, so let's see what you think as far as um, some of the things she mentions. You're afraid you have no talent. You're afraid you'll be rejected, criticized, ridiculed, misunderstood, or worst of all, ignored. No. <laughs> Didn't that be the worst? Nobody even noticed I did that thing. <clears throat> you're afraid somebody else already did it better, and you're also afraid everybody else already did it better. <laughs> 
You're afraid you won't be taken seriously. You're afraid your dreams are embarrassing. You're afraid you don't have time or financial freedom to pursue your dreams because you know your life is so filled with the other stuff that you think you should be doing. You're afraid you're too fat. And this one is fun <laughs> because she said, this doesn't have to do with creativity. It's just like pretty much most people think they're too fat. So, <laughs> and, um, and it can stop you from doing things. You're afraid you're too young or too old to start. You're afraid that you'll upset your family by what might be revealed when you do this. You're afraid of unleashing your innermost demons and you don't want to encounter them. And also you're afraid of what your peers and your coworkers will say if you express your truth aloud. Hmm. That's a lot, and that wasn't even all the, that she had in the book. <laughs> so to sum it up, it's scary, scary, scary <laughs> to live this creative life. And I speak from my own experience here that most of the things that creatively that I wanted to do were scary, and more, more scary in the beginning, and got better as I did it. Auditioning for Broadway shows was scary. You get up in front of people, you're, what are they going to think of me? Am I going to sing well, I'm going to impress them, whatever. Uh, there's rejection, there's judgment, there's feelings of not good enough, not pretty enough. Um, I, am I going to freeze? All that stuff that comes up, and like, even with now, and I'm so spiritually evolved now. <laughs> 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 and I'm doing this show, Sweeney Todd, and I'm playing this big role, Mrs. Lovett, and there's just like, the fear, it's not like it went away. And I, I meditate and I pray and affirm and all that. And things come up in the moment, especially when I'm trying to remember lines I just memorized or doing a very difficult Stephen Sondheim tune where I'm saying a hundred words in a second. So, yeah. She says, once you start listening to the fear, that um, track that plays in your mind of fear, you notice it's kind of boring. Mm -hmm. It's boring because it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. You really listen to what it's saying. It's saying the same thing again and again. And it becomes boring to everyone else, too, she says. <laughs> that, you know, you holding yourself back and telling people about why you're afraid, why you don't want to live your dream, your excuses, <sighs> gets boring to people. I thought that was interesting. The, the fear thoughts, they have no variety, no depth, and no substance. Basically, they're a song with one note, and the note is stop. Stop, 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 stop. Don't do it, just stop. So if we follow the fear, what is, if, if it's just telling you to stop, what is it going to lead to? Nothing. Nothing, right? <laughs> Absolutely nothing. You're just not going to do anything if you just listen to the fear and do what it's telling you. And the thing is, is that we're all wired to be afraid of the unknown. It's actually a survival technique that, that we have as, as animals, humans, you know, beings with a body on this planet, so that we avoid things that might cause us harm, right? She says that if you pass your hand over a petri dish that contains a tadpole, the tadpole will flinch beneath the shadow of your hand. Isn't that interesting? That, that little tiny tadpole that has the tiny, tiny little brain is responding in fear to your hand. That this is a deeply ancient instinct, this fear, and it keeps you from walking into traffic, you know, things like you're burning your hand on the stove, things like that. But it's not especially smart. It's not especially smart and deep and developed, okay? Um, so she says there's the fear that you need and the fear that you don't need. Okay, the fear to not walk into traffic, you need that. Okay, you want to keep that, that's good. Um, but, and the truth is that you don't need to be fearless to live a creative life. Isn't that great? You don't have to feel like you have to eliminate fear because she said you actually can't do that. So stop trying to do that or think you can do that or that it's necessary. She said the only people who live without fear are like sociopaths, yeah. <laughs> okay, or um, like really um, reckless three-year-olds, <laughs> and we don't want to be like that either. 
So, so, so you don't need to have fear to be creative. You don't need, it's not like you need the fear to be creative, but fear will show up. It just will show up, especially when you are doing something that is the unknown or pushing yourself beyond what you've done before. Um, because you're being inventive, she said, this is it. When you're being inventive in your life, when you're trying something new, you're putting something out there, you're entering into a realm of uncertain outcomes. I don't know what could happen here. I could fail, I could fall flat on my back, or whatever. And we've been wired to be hyper vigilant and insanely protective around this area, this uh, fear of uncertain outcomes. So she says what we can do that can really help us to have courage here around this fear is to make some space for it. Make a lot of space for it, plenty, plenty of space for it. That if you can build enough of an expansive inner life that you can be present to the fear, you can even feel it in your body and just let it be that the creativity and the fear can coexist at the same time. But it's like this. It's like you're on a road trip and the fear is in the back seat. And the fear might, might be, you know, back seat driving, is that what it's called, right? When people sit in the back seat and they tell you how to drive? Back seat driver. <laughs> it, might, it can speak, you can listen to the fear, but the fear never takes the wheel, never puts its foot on the gas or the brake, ever. It's not allowed to do that. But the fear has a space, the fear can be present, and it's along for the ride. Know that it will be along for the ride. So you might as well not resist it. It's just, oh, that's what it's like. Somebody asked me in the show the other day, like, oh, are you nervous? I'm like, that's just part of it. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> you know, it's not going to stop me from doing it. But, yeah, kind of. Yeah. yeah. It's, just, it's in the car, but it's not driving the car. So it's not always easy to carry your fear around with you, but it's worth it if you can learn to travel comfortably with your fear. And because you have extraordinary treasures within you, it really would be a shame for the world not to experience them because you're listening to your fear and not moving forward on what's in you. So to bring these treasures to light, I tell you, Sweeney Todd, we rehearsed a couple months. I found out about this part in July and I've been working on it ever since then. To bring your creativity to light, it takes work. It takes dedication. It takes practice. I'm sure David can tell you the years it took him to learn how to play piano the way that he plays and to sing the way he sings. Years of dedication and courage and hours of devotion. But you know what? It's worth it. And there's just not enough time in life. We're here for a limited time engagement. There's not enough time for us to play small. So I encourage you to experience big magic and to live more creatively in your life. Namaste. I love that, Jean Marie. You were talking about um, the work associated with living creatively. There's a great quote by um, Chuck Close, who is an author, and he says, inspiration is for amateurs. <laughs> that real creativity comes through the process of engagement and staying in it, and just staying yeah. in it and staying in it. And it sings back to you in the process of it. And you might come up with something great, but in the meantime, you're engaged. And that, that really is the end game. Mm. Yeah, yeah that, that happens for me when I work on something. I think about like some of the songs that I sing in the show. Because I get, because I, I love doing unity services, but one thing about it is that we do something and then the next week we do something different. And we don't always get to keep doing that. Right. It comes around once a year, a couple times a year or something. Um, but like to do a show and you're working on the, this thing for over and over and it's like, I'm singing that better. <laughs> I'm getting better at this. And uh, to get to kind of hone something is like, part of the magic, I think, of, of that dedication and keeping at it, and then it can surprise you with some hit, that hidden treasure. 
Oh, well, that's a great, great insight. Um, yeah, because I, I wondered about that too, about you know doing something over and over and over and over, especially those who have successful Broadway stints and they just they go on for years doing the same shows and you know I've heard different things about their reactions to it but but I love your perception that you know you're you're honing and, and it makes sense doesn't it that you know you that you go down the same groove and you start to expand into it right you know and you, and something in you grows because of practice right yeah that's that's really cool it's a, a cool way of looking at it I was listening to you talking about the fear, you know, of doing something different, and um, of course we all experience it. Um, I, I, I have, I, I don't know if this is a trick of my own mind, but what I do with the fear is that I just translate it into excitement, you know, because mm -hmm. the whole idea is that I'm, like you said, I'm not going to let it stop me. I'm going to go do it anyway. I'm going to go headlong into it. I'm going to jump off the cliff. I'm going to dive head first into whatever it is. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen. And it could be a calamity. It could be catastrophe. But I'm still going to do it. But I might as well go there, you know, at full throttle zing, you know. <laughs> Just like really, I'm doing this, you know. It's, uh, I'm going to jump into it. And and the, the cool thing is, is that um, I think that we don't really get pulled into doing something, even if there's a lot of ego involved, you know, ego's not always a good judgment, uh, a good judge of what we're really going to be good at, that's for darn sure, but, but it could be ego, but it could also be that, uh, that, that gem that wants to come out, you know, that wants to be shown off, and, and it might be some part of you that is, you know, wanting to experience that, and fear to me is the the lousiest reason to not do something, you know, it's really, it's really, um, it's really given to you to, to, um, to empower you. I mean, I really think it's just to carry you over the edge. It's to lift you up off your feet and over, over the barrier. You know, I think that's really what it's for. It's just an extra zing, and in no way should we let it talk us out of it. You know? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. When, when I'm working with kids and they're, they're, uh, and the conversation comes around to nervousness or something like that, I, 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 I believe this with my heart and soul, but when you're nine or seven or whatever and you're hearing this for the first time, it's a little, it's a little hard to believe, but it's like, I say, that's part of the fun. That's why we do this is mm -hmm. you know, to, to get that, uh, that nervous energy. It's, this is a good thing. We like this. Uh, and in fact, if, if you lose that, you kind of need to change the game a little bit. You know, those people who've done, you know, the same role year after year after year. It's like, they have to, you, you got to find novelty in it again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite things in life is to see talented, well-prepared people nervous. <laughs> <laughs> it's just delicious. It's just <laughs> wonderful. I just, it's so exciting because they're like on the high wire, you know, and, and then... And incredible things happen. And we actually experience that a lot here at Unity. You know, we, we, we set up a, a structure of like, okay, this is going to get it done. And then our singers, they swing out. I mean, yeah. Michael's like that. They're, well, you're like that. You were tonight. And, and you were well prepared. And, but you were also creating. You were using our presence to inform the moment. I love that. Yeah. Cool. That. It's, it's cool. Get to do this job. <laughs> exactly <laughs> right. Exactly right. And and to be able to, like you said, use the energy. You know, it's it. This is the thing. You know that that um, in the meditation. You know, mm -hmm. like something that you want to do or whatever. And I, what really brings you alive. And this is it. You know, when you get to be able to co-create with the energy in the room, and things will come out of you that are not on the page. A great example is Reverend Michael on Sunday in particular. I, I feel certain that he got very little of what he had written said. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure he captured the, the, the nut of it, but what he said at the time was coming from some other place, you know, and, and you could, everybody could feel it. You know, we could really feel it in the room. And when those moments happen where 
where you allow yourself to be a channel, you know, to be allow yourself. I mean, you just want to do that all the time. You know, you want that to be the way you, you do things, you know. Um, Jean Marie was talking about me being a short timer, and I'm, I've got a list of things I want to go do, uh, you know, just really fun. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking about it. Um, I wasn't planning to, but I, I've been talking about it, and I'm, I'm, I want to try stand-up comedy because um, because it's the most because it's the most terrifying thing I can think of. Really. Um, because I'm not a physical, I'm not physically am ambitious or, or physically courageous. I don't jump out of buildings or out of perfectly good airplanes or anything. Like that. You know, I'm not going to ever. I, I'm, I, I hope to live my entire life and never have to do that. So that's that's my goal. But but I don't mind crashing and burning in front of an audience. If I, I've demonstrated it uh, on, on occasion, and um, I really. I mean, it's not my goal, but um, but I think it would be so fun to be living on that kind of an edge and to try to create something with a room that may or may not be loving you already, you know, like you guys are. And I will find out how much my uh, ego that is used to being coddled by you um, <laughs> will actually tolerate, you know, hecklers and all that kind of thing. Just for the fun of it, and just until it's not fun anymore. I mean, it's really only for fun, with no other ambition. Or improv, possibly. Or just maybe just straight out storytelling. But comedians have a very particular role in our society. They're the court jester. And the same time that they're making you laugh, they're also saying something that's true. And there's truth-telling that's happening. And I'm intrigued by that. And I want to, I'm, I'm, I'm paying attention to it and thinking about ways that I can use the ministerial truth in a way, or the way that I've accessed it in this role, um, without preaching, I hope, mm -hmm. in a way that inspires or that does that. I don't know, it's just a different medium. So anyway, I'm kind of excited to... Um, and terrified to try <laughs> doing that, but I think that would be fun. Yeah. And when it's not fun, I'll go do something fun because after all, I'm retired. <laughs> That's how I'm going to look at it anyway. Yeah. But I, I think we never stop, right? We shouldn't yeah. while we're breathing, you know? Yeah. Is that what you think? Yeah. That you have something that, that excites you and lights you up that, that you've never done. I think we all just continue, can, can continue to have that as because that creative impulse just keeps burning and wants to be expressed no matter our age or what's going on in our lives. Mm -hmm. I want to be in that audience. I do too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I doubt she it. has a really saucy tongue, I will say. Yeah, it would be different um, vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> More like what I use around the house, actually. <laughs> Um, and, and it would be fun, and you know this this whole idea of like trying to create who you are, or or to or to be willing to be whatever you are. I mean, I, I've already got a leg up. I'm missing a front tooth, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like it's like I'm you know no pretense here. You know, so I just think it would be interesting. Anyway, but I, I have one more thought about uh, uh, piggybacking a bit on what Karen was saying and, and what's been referenced um, a few times about the, the spirit of joy that comes when you're really engaged in unleashing our creative gems, as it were. Something I've grown to appreciate as I've gotten older is the capacity to stay in that state of joy as it's created, as when... When, I, when we, I, certainly my experience, when I was younger, and I would kind of get overwhelmed with joy, you know, like, wow, this is fun. It's like almost the moment I recognized how great the moment was, that was the recipe for ending it. It just like, it just it becomes self-reflective in a way that is no longer sustainable. That it, it's kind of like crashing on a wave if you're surfing, you know? It's like, wow, that was great. You know, it doesn't. But as I've gotten older, I've been able to have, I've, I've been able to live in the creative experience and then have a witness self present at the same time. I was, I, I, this idea um, came to me as you were talking about fear, 
being in the back seat, being a passenger in the process, and you've got all, all these complex selves that are that are attendant to this creating, not not merely witnessing, but creating this. I would even argue that fear has a role. You know, it sort of helps us that nervous energy that mm-hmm. kind of keeps us alert in a way. And um, so, some of my more euphoric moments in life has been when um, I've had that experience. It, for me, it's usually around conducting. Uh, I've experienced it at the piano and then singing, but usually it's when I'm conducting. And um, if I'm just like in it and everything is just going great. When I was younger, I would, I would stumble at that point. And I, I mean, nobody would really know, right? Okay. But that moment had been lost, but now if I can get there, I can sustain it, and uh, not even for the purpose of sustaining it, but just living in the, the, the unfolding moment of now. Um, and that I think that just comes with experience, age and experience. I don't, I don't think we're born into that. We okay. can grow into it. Yeah, yeah, to have that mindfulness around it definitely comes from experience. It's like when you were first learning the role, you learned the role, you got it on its feet, it's exciting, but now you can kind of surf in it, right? You, yeah. you're, you know what's going to happen and you can lean into it as it comes. Yeah, well that's the whole idea of rehearsal is that, <laughs> so that once you get to the performance you can just be the character rather than think it mechanically through it, right? That's the, right. you want to give, give that experience of like it's really happening, right? So. There, but there's still that part of me that knows, okay, the set's moving now, I don't want to walk into that, or, you know, there's, there's still, it's amazing how the brain adjusts to the, the reality and not reality of the whole thing. It's really cool. Yeah. Enough about me. That's great. <laughs> it's about all of us, though. That's true. You made it beautiful for us. Thank you. Thank so, you for watching this message today. I'd like to invite you to join us in person here on campus at Unity of Houston for Sunday morning or Wednesday evening services. If you can't be with us here on our campus, you can still join us live on Facebook or on our website, unityhouston.org, Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Central.